Okay, so let us then begin. We can begin with three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. Then we do the salutation. Namo tasa. <clears throat> Namo tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Okay, good morning, everybody. And today we are beginning a new phase, a new book in our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya. So the last class, we finished the Chattuka Nipata, the book of the fours. And now we are about to start the book of the fives. So we've gone through the ones, twos, threes, and fours already. So quite a lot of material we've covered. I think we started the Anguttara Nikaya, was it 2016, Okay, so now we are starting, we're starting with sutta number one. And the first chapter of this book and part of the second chapter are concerned with the concept of powers, or what is called in Pali, bala, powers or strengths. And the first set of suttas is concerned with what are called the five trainee powers. So I don't know how is the size. It's great, Bhante. Okay. So we have the five trainee powers. And you could see the Pali term is Pancha Seka Balani. And these are a little different from there is a usual set of five powers, which we'll encounter a little bit later in this chapter, in I think it starts in the sutta number 13 or 14, we'll meet the regular five powers, which are included in the 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhammas, the 37 aids to enlightenment. We are starting in 513. But this is a different expression. Partly some of the factors are the same. These are called the trainee powers the powers of a trainee. And so what is a trainee? So this is used in the, in the canonical text in the technical, with a somewhat technical nuance to it. It doesn't mean anybody who has undertaken the Buddha's training, but it refers technically to one at seven levels of achievement, of spiritual achievement. So if you've been following the, the Dhammas for some time, you know that there are four paths and four fruits. And these are the paths and fruits of stream entry, once returning, non-returning, and our hardship.
Now, those disciples at the level of the four paths and four fruits are called trainees. The Pali word is seka, which is based on the noun sika. Sika is the training and one engaged in the training in this higher sense is a seka. So we could call this maybe the disciple in the higher training. So one at the path of stream entry, at the fruit of stream entry, the path and fruit of once returning, the path and fruit of non-returning, and one at the path of arhatship is called a seka, one in training, in the higher training or a trainee. The arahat is not called a seka, not called a trainee. Why isn't the arahat called a trainee? Because he's completed the training. Yeah, exactly. So the arahat is one who is, the expression we come across, katang Karaniya, one who has done what had to be done. What, what had to be done is the training in the higher conduct, the higher samadhi, the higher wisdom. And so one who has completed that training, the, the arhat is one who has completed that training. And so therefore the arhat is called a seka. The uh is a negation. So one who is not a trainee, not like us, we could say. <laughs> I could say I'm an usaker and that I'm not a trainee, <laughs> not, not yet reached the higher training. But it, if I say that, this doesn't mean I'm an arhat. But the arhat is a usaker in the sense that he has completed the training nothing more to train in okay so those are the tra so that is those are the trainees the seven kinds of trainees and these trainees possess as part of their in inalienable equipment they possess these five powers and the meaning of power is the commentary gives a definition of it. Did I copy that? <clears throat> yeah, it uses the general term, that which cannot be shaken, which cannot be disturbed, which cannot be overcome. So the trainee has these five powers which cannot be overcome by their opposites. So the trainee, when one enters even the lowest stage of the trainee, the one on the path to stream entry, one can never fall away from the path to final liberation. It might take a long time to reach the fruit, to reach the final goal, but the maximum, it said, is seven more existences, seven more lives. And as a trainee, one possesses these five powers so that one can never be overcome, never be vanquished by lack of faith. In other words, by doubt. Never be overcome by a lack of moral shame. And I'll explain these terms as we come to them. Never be overcome by a kind of moral recklessness so that one could act in immoral ways, unethical ways, without any concern for the consequences. One can never be overcome by laziness. Well, this is something I have to work on. So you, he has the power of energy. So 
Of course, he has to take a rest and sleep and do other things, but never discards the training because of laziness and can never be overcome by foolishness, by ignorance, by delusion. It doesn't mean that he's completely eradicated ignorance, but he has that power of wisdom, which as he continues to cultivate the power of wisdom, will dispel more and more of the mist and clouds of ignorance until when all ignorance is dispelled, then there comes the realization of the fruit of arhatship. Okay, so those are the five trainee powers. And here the Buddha says you should, this is how you should train yourself. So you have to train to acquire, actually the trainees already possess these powers, but the Buddha is telling the monks in general, including those who are not yet at the stage of trainees, that you should acquire this trainee's power of faith, the trainee's power of moral shame, moral dread, energy, and wisdom. Okay, so this is the opening sutta, which is a kind of broad or general statement. And this we can call this in Pali, this would be called an upadesa or a sankhita. Sankita Desana, that means a concise or abridged teaching. The next sutta is a vibhanga or a, what is the Pali word that's used here? Vitata. Yeah, vitata or vitara. Vitara is an elaborated teaching. Yeah, so we have, or it could be called also a nidesa. So we have the, oops. Yeah, these words to designate the different, the Buddha's different styles of teaching. One is udesa, which is a concise teaching, also known as a, Sankita Desana, a concise or compressed teaching. Or well, the noun from this is Sankepa. And then the opposite of this would be a Nidesa, that's an elaborated teaching, where the Buddha teaches Vitara in detail. Well, from this we get. Vitata Desana, an elaborated teaching. Okay, so now in this elaborated teaching, the Buddha is going to give like standard definitions of the five trainee powers. Okay, so here we have the trainee power of faith. What is it? So then it's said that the noble disciple is endowed with faith and places faith in the enlightenment of the Tathagata, that is of the Buddha. So that is the object of faith in amongst the trainee powers. So it's not personal devotion to the Buddha, though of course a disciple will, will have personal devotion, but it is faith and faith involves not just an emotional feeling, but it involves an aspect of belief or conviction that one is willing to accept the Buddha as a fully enlightened one, one who has attained and reached the Anuttara Samasambodhi, the supreme perfect enlightenment. And what's meant by placing this faith in the enlightenment of the Buddha 
is that one accepts the Buddha by way of these various designations. So this might have been a later addition by, or an addition by the compilers of the texts in order to show what is meant by putting faith in the enlightenment of the Buddha. Because here we have a sort of stock definition of the Buddha by way of the nine epithets, the arahat, that is one who has completely eliminated all defilements, the one who is perfectly enlightened, who has realized the nature of all phenomena, one who possesses clear knowledge and good conduct, one who is blessed with the achievement of the good path and the attainment of Nibbana, one who knows the world, the cosmic world, the world of phenomena, the world of sentient beings, the unsurpassed trainer of persons to be tamed, teacher of devas and humans, the enlightened one, the Bhagavad. So that is the power of faith. And up until we reach the stage of being a trainee, we have, there are different degrees of faith. So we have, say, as being ordinary Buddhist followers, we have, I would call this, maybe I'll coin an expression. Provisional faith. And then on the basis of provisional faith, it's enough faith, enough trust, enough confidence that one is willing to say, accept on trust the teachings of the Buddha that lie outside one's range of comprehensions. And on that basis, one undertakes the practice. And let's say building up to provisional faith, there'll be something like a spirit of inquiry. Study of the teaching, reflection on the teaching, maybe partial practice. So you've maybe you've never done meditation before. You're not ready to place faith in the whole hog of the Buddha, Buddha Dharma, but you do some meditation, maybe do a week long or 10 day meditation retreat, or you do a daily practice you start getting some benefits. You see how it's changing your life. You observe the precepts and you find that it makes your life smoother, easier. And maybe you start giving some precedence to qualities like loving kindness, compassion. You make some effort to control greed, anger, pride, vanity, and so on. And you start to experience real concrete benefits in your everyday life. And on that basis, you place in the Buddha or in the triple gem, what I call provisional faith. And maybe you give expression to that provisional faith by going for refuge to the three refuges and formally taking the five precepts etc. And then maybe you take up then a daily practice of meditation and more Dharma study, etc. So this would maybe we'll call this initial practice in which you're sort of accumulating, gradually accumulating wholesome qualities, working at removing unwholesome qualities and developing wholesome qualities. And then maybe at a certain point, one will enter into intensified practice 
And this will differ for different people. Maybe for some people it will be like dropping everything and becoming a monastic monk or nun. Other people in lay life maybe will do like longer personal retreats. And some people maybe don't need that, but they just do their regular daily practice. But because of their good, their paramis and good roots from past lives, they build up a certain force so that even with an hour daily meditation, they can reach very deep levels of, of practice. And then when that intensified practice comes to a peak, then there comes the entry upon the path, that would be the path of stream entry. And then at this stage, we're entering upon the, the, the irreversible path and doubt is completely abandoned. So doubt is called a fetter. And at the stage of, actually it's at the stage of stream entry that it's completely abandoned. But let's say you enter upon the path, then comes the first fruit. And at the stage of the first fruit, which is stream entry, doubt is abandoned and faith becomes unshakable. You find some kind of um, account of this stages of progress in a sutta in the Majjhimani Kaya. This would be sutta number 95, the Chanki Sutta. And also we'll find it later in some parts of the Anguttara Nikaya, the book of sixes in particular. Okay, so this is the power of faith. Now comes the power of moral shame. And here we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, first, let's get the definition. Okay, here a noble disciple has a sense of moral shame. And the Pali word is hiri. He is, or he or she is ashamed of bodily and verbal, bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct, ashamed of sort of accumulating or reinforcing bad, unwholesome qualities of character, we can say. So that is the power of moral shame. And moral shame, almost, I think everywhere is invariably connected with another quality, another power, which I translate as moral dread. The Pali is otappa. Yeah, some places I've translated this as fearlessness in regard to wrongdoing. Okay, so the definition is the noble disciple dreads wrongdoing. He dreads bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct. He dreads acquiring or building up, accumulating bad, unwholesome qualities of character. So that is the power of moral dread. Yeah, for the distinction between the two, go to the book of twos. And so I also opened up the book of twos so that we could see the explanation. Yeah, actually this isn't an explanation, but we have here a sutta which says that calls these two qualities, Hiri and Otapa calls them the bright qualities that protect the world. And so the sutta says, if these two bright qualities 
did not exist and protect the world, we would not see here any kind of restraint, any kind, that I think it's indicating with regard to sexual desire or sexual activity regarding one's mother, one's aunts, the wives of one's teachers and other respected people. But the world would become promiscuous like goats and sheep, chickens and pigs, dogs and jackals. But because these two bright qualities protect the world, we see here um, restraint regarding these people. And of course, this is stated with regard to males, but we could say the same thing in reverse in regard to females. Yeah, but this is what I wanted was the note which explains what is meant by these two qualities, Hiri and Otapa. So Hiri is explained as disgust, or maybe disgust, I don't like, revulsion at bodily and verbal misconduct, and also at mental misconduct, at unwholesome thoughts, desires, impulses of the mind. And moral dread is dread over such misconduct, dread over bodily and verbal misconduct, and dread or kind of even fear over the arising of bad, unwholesome desires and impulses in the mind. So what, what is the difference, the actual difference between Hiri and Otapa? So this is based on the commentaries, or maybe my own reflection. <clears throat> yeah, this is the way I, I understand it, that Hiri is directed inwardly and arises from self-respect, that is from a desire to preserve one's self-respect. And it motivates you to reject wrongdoing to when desires arise, impulses, thoughts of engaging in particular types of conduct, then when hiri arises, it, you experience revulsion or a kind of distaste for those thoughts, impulses, and desires based on the desire to preserve one's own inherent dignity. That is, one gets the sense that if one engages in those actions or one al allows oneself to indulge in those thoughts, desires, fantasies, and so on, you're going to be staining the inherent or potential purity of one's character. And so one wants to maintain the sense of self-respect to maintain the sense that I I'm a dignified person, that I possess a dignified character. And on that basis, one refuses to entertain those thoughts and refuses to engage in those activities. But moral dread is rather, it's based on the fear of the consequences. And the consequences can be conceived either in terms of karma, the karmic results of engaging in those actions, or more in a more practical sense, fear of blame and even punishment. So, Okay, so this is like the faith that often be, befalls, let us say, powerful persons, whether in the entertainment business or in politics. Okay, so we have like somebody, a very powerful figure. I'm thinking of this film producer, Harvey Weinstein, who may be back in the 1990s, the 2000s, he was at the top of the world like an emperor in the film industry. And he was very highly respected. 
But then some women, maybe were they actresses? I don't remember who, or secretaries, started to squeal on him. This was the arising of the Me Too movement. And before long, Harvey Weinstein is publicly humiliated. All of the newspapers, the magazines are blasting headlines. Harvey Weinstein accused of sexually exploiting such and such actresses. And one case after another builds up until where is Harvey Weinstein now? I think he's in prison. And we've had this with, <laughs> with politicians, I'm thinking of, <laughs> excuse me, Bill Clinton. <laughs> You <laughs> have you ever indulged in sexual relations with your intern, Monica? That was her name, Monica Lewinsky. No, I never engaged in sexual relations with her, thinking in the back of his mind. <laughs> sexual relations means full genital sexual intercourse. So I could truthfully say I never engaged in sexual relations with her. But then the truth comes out, maybe he didn't engage in general intercourse, but he had other kinds of sexual relations. He managed to retain his position as the president, but he was humiliated and blamed publicly. And other people get engaged in wrongdoing. And then when the truth comes out, they get publicly humiliated. And even if it's a crime, imprisoned. But even if you escape the consequences in this life, you can't escape the karmic consequences. So there's that verse in the Dhammapada that even if you go high into a cave in the mountain, or even if you try to hide under the sea, there's no place where you can escape the consequences, the fruits of an evil deed. So when you recognize that you can't escape the consequences, then you have this otapa, the fear or dread of the consequences. Okay, so this is hiri and otapa. And though I translate hiri, the sense of shame, like nowadays the word shame is getting bad press because there's this phenomenon that's come out that's called shaming people. Like if somebody is overweight, they shame them for being, you're fat. Or if somebody is maybe too thin, they shame them, you're too thin. Or if somebody has freckles, they shame them, you freckle face, freckle face. Or I don't know if they have some kind of maybe if they're physically lame, so they get shame for being lame, whatever. Or if they, people from other countries, immigrants who come to the US, the kids in the school maybe get shamed because they're not native speakers of English and so on. But the word shame is not being used in that sense. But this is what I call moral shame. And it's a quality that arises before one indulges in the unwholesome action. <clears throat> It is that particular mental factor or faculty that prevents one, that holds one back from engaging in the action because of the concern for one's inherent dignity, the desire to preserve one's innate dignity. Okay, so now we've gone through Hiri Otapa. Now we come to the power of energy <clears throat> and the definition, the disciple has aroused energy <coughs> to abandon unwholesome qualities. These would be mental states and acquire wholesome qualities. So that is the sort of the first aspect. We have this division between or distinction between Dhammas, qualities, as being 
akusala unwholesome and kusala wholesome. And our task and practice is to abandon the unwholesome qualities that we already have and to arouse, strengthen, and develop the wholesome qualities that we want to possess. And so then it continues that he's strong, firm in exertion, and doesn't cast off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. So that's the power of energy. And then we have the power of wisdom. And this is explained that the noble disciple is wise. Of course, this is panya. Energy is virya. Wisdom is virya. So here, the noble disi disciple is wise. He possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, that is noble and penetrative, that leads to the complete destruction of dukkha. Well, let me get the Pali for this. Yeah, so it's an interesting definition of this kind of wisdom. So the wisdom is said to be involved with udaya. Udaya means arising. And atangama means passing away, vanishing. And then we form an adjective, combining it, form an adjective. So this is the wisdom of arising and passing away. So in other words, it's the wisdom that sees into the arising and passing away of all conditioned phenomena. So in other words, this is the wisdom that sees into the reality of impermanence. And that wisdom here is called noble and penetrative the Baidika means, that's yeah, an interesting word from the root is Vyad, which means to pierce. And I think it gives the verb, I think is Vaidity. To pierce through. So it's piercing, penetrative wisdom. And it leads to the complete um, destruction of dukkha, of suffering. So this is actually referring, technically, this is referring to the wisdom of insight or the pasana wisdom. And the commentary says it's the wisdom that can penetrate the arising and vanishing of the five aggregates. Okay, so that is the definition of the five powers of a trainee. And I want to look now to jump ahead and look at the five power, <coughs> the other list of, <coughs> of five powers. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting a little phlegm in my throat.
Okay. We have the standard list of five powers <clears throat> in the book of fives, number 13. So here we have the power of faith, power of energy. So these two are common to the five trainee powers, but then we have the power, and then we have the power of wisdom here, also a common factor. But then we have two powers that are different that replace Hiri and Otapa. Here we have the power of mindfulness and the power of concentration. And these five, the way I look at it, form a quite, let's say, meaningful or comprehensible sequence representing stages of progress. So we start off with the power of faith. And then through the power of faith, one engages with the practice with energy. And the main part of the practice with which one engages is the development of the four foundations of mindfulness. So we have the power of energy and the power of mindfulness working together as a pair. And when energy and mindfulness work together, they give rise initially to the power of concentration. And then based on the power of concentration, one starts to investigate the nature of phenomena and that brings into play the power of wisdom. So here we could see a kind of meaningful sequence in the five powers. And again, the meaning of power is the same as in the trainee powers. That is that which cannot be shaken or disrupted by the opposite. So faith cannot be shaken by doubt. Energy cannot be shaken by laziness. Mindfulness cannot be shaken by, let's say, lack of mindfulness, absent-mindedness, dullness of mind. Concentration, the power of concentration, cannot be shaken by distractedness, by the scatteredness of mind. And wisdom as a power cannot be shaken by ignorance, delusion, foolishness. <clears throat> okay, so this is the Udesa, the concise teaching. Then comes the Nidesa, the elaborate teaching. So what is the power of faith? And here we have same definition, faith in the enlightenment of the Tathagata. The power of energy, same definition, arousing energy to abandon unwholesome qualities and acquire wholesome qualities and so on. <clears throat> I'll just jump to the power of wisdom. So what is the power of wisdom? Again, the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away that is the wisdom of insight. But then we have the power of mindfulness. What is the power of mindfulness? And this is a little bit puzzling, but we look at it. So here, the noble disciple is mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and alertness, one who remembers and recollects what was done and said long ago. And I say that it's puzzling because you would have expected the power of mindfulness to be so something like the noble disciple is one who cultivates or dwells contemplating the body and the body, feelings and feelings, mind and mind, dhammas as dhammas. In other words, one who practices the four foundations of mindfulness. Let me get.
Okay, so the reason I say this is interesting is because the word, the Pali word sati, which we always translate as mindfulness, is derived from the verb sarati, which originally means to remember. And then we have anusati, which we use when we say like Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha, comes from Anu Sarati. Actually, I think it's Anu Sarati. No, it's Anu Sarati. Okay. So here, the text is defining the power of mindfulness, not by way of the awareness of what is taking place in the present, which is what is involved in cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness, but rather explaining it in terms of the original sense of remembering. So the disciple is one who remembers and recollects what was done long ago, what was spoken long ago. But there seems that there's a connection between mindfulness in the way we usually understand it and having a good memory. Since when we do things with mindfulness, then we can remember them. If we just go about doing things carelessly, in a sloppy way, inattentively, then we easily forget them. Okay, then comes the power of concentration. And here the definition is given by way of the four jhanas. That's the standard way of elaborating upon samadhi is by way of the four jhanas. The question that can be asked, does this mean that jhana is absolutely indispensable? That's a long debated point. My own view is that there are degrees of concentration lower than the jhanas, which are, <clears throat> which are adequate for developing insight and even for realizing the paths and fruits. But it seems that the suttas are constructed by having fixed definitions. And so to define concentration, they bring in the formula, a formulaic definition by way of the four jhanas. So those are the five powers, but I just want to quickly come in to see where the five powers are to be seen. Because this shows us, gives us st a still different light on the powers. Okay, so where is the power of faith to be seen? So it's here the definition is not exclusively by way of the enlightenment of the Tathagata, but is to be seen in the four factors of stream entry. Maybe I should leave this for next week. Yeah, otherwise I'm trying to fit in too much. And maybe now we could see if there's any questions. So if you have any questions on what we've covered so far, please use the hand device, the raise hand device. Okay, so I say a few, okay, Wiley, you unmute. Bhante, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. All right, um, was looking at the five powers and kind of the concept you see is certain things are antidotes to other things. Could it be said that mindfulness is the antidote to hearing and concentration is the antidote to a copy? To a top Um, Because, okay, mindfulness, keeps you mindful of not falling. Um, concentration keeps you from being distracted by doubts and things that arise, which would be kind of an outcome of the otapi. So the difference in the two list is one just an antidote to the other, or can, could it be could it be yeah. stated? That way? I've never seen it stated that way, but I do think. <clears throat> Let me just clear my throat. 
It seems that mindfulness <clears throat> would play an important role, I would think, in both I would actually align mindfulness with Hiri and maybe clear comprehension, mm -hmm. not samadhi, but clear comprehension, which is an aspect of wisdom with otappa. Again, I've never seen this alignment made in the text. Of course, mindfulness, maybe sort of reminds you that mm -hmm. these types of actions one is inclined to, or these thoughts one is entertaining, it reminds you that these are unwholesome and that you have to you know, eliminate them. And with Sampajanya, clear comprehension, when one is, say, giving rise to unwholesome impulses, and so forth, clear comprehension reminds you of the consequences. So it involves some degree of understanding the working of cause and effect. In fact, someplace I think I've seen some connection drawn between clear comprehension and otapa. I don't remember where. Okay, so this yeah, requires like further reflection. I see a whole bunch of hands. So, so let's move on. Thank you, Bonte. Okay, I see BC Deborah, and you unmute. Yes, Bonte. Can you hear me? All yeah, right. Very, yeah, clearly. Thank you. I'm I'm wondering about the um, equivalency, maybe, um, of moral dread and moral shame, because moral dread seems like um, doing the right thing because others are watching, and moral shame seems like understanding the danger in in uh, you know what whatever is the defilement and so not engaging in it because one sees it is wrong so i i'm just wondering about that um sort of just that where more where moral dread falls it, it seems like um being worried about the consequences is different than recognizing the evilness in the act. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely they are two different uh, factors, which is why they're mentioned separately. Mm -hmm. And, but they both, they work closely together, but I would say that different people maybe um, give precedence to one rather than the other. And it, it seems to me that Hiri is a nobler quality than Otapa, because with Hiri, one restrains from the evil because of a sense of the intrinsic badness of the yeah. actions one might engage in or the thoughts, the impulses what one might entertain. Whereas with moral dread, with Otapa, there's a fear of what's going to happen to me, to, what's going to happen to me. What are others going to think? What kind of punishment might come to me? But still, I think the Buddha mentions these because, you know, to, for some people to keep their conduct in check, to keep the mind in check, you do have to be aware of the consequences. Yeah, it almost seems like a um, coarser understanding of karma is, is and, and, um, a, almost a subtler understanding of karma is is to see the act as as evil and as you say the dignity and, and the other is well, i don't want i don't want to be punished by karma yeah yeah i, I was I, I would agree with that okay thank you yeah okay and then you put down the hand then next is yeah. andrew thank you Bonte. I had a question about the word trainee, seka. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask, what is the relation to when when we speak of the Buddha as the, the trainer of one willing to be tamed? Yeah. In the Kese, Kesi Sutta. Um, yeah. Is it is it the same word? Is it seka? 
No, that is the word. Excuse me. The word is dhamma, which let me put it in. Yeah, this word originally it's used in relation to animals. So we have a elephant to be tamed, a horse to be tamed, a bull to be tamed. And so the task of like the elephant trainer or the horse trainer is to tame their horses or their elephants. And so here the Buddha is called Purisadhamma. So one who trains people to be tamed. Yeah, and so this applies you know, to everybody who has the capacity to be trained, to be tamed. Um, it's not just to sekas, but even when the Buddha meets somebody like a violent, cruel person, like Angulimala, but who still has the potential for achievement, for realization, the Buddha will say, even Angulimala is Purisadhamma, a person capable of training. Okay. It's very clear. Thank you. Okay. And then the next is Diana. Uh, yes. Good morning, Bande. Good morning. I have this question on the Sutta number seven. Um, the last paragraph, no, yeah, the last paragraph is say, about the sensual pleasures, inferior sensual pleasures, middling sensual pleasures, and superior sensual pleasures. So for the inferior and middling, I kind of figure out what the example is. Can Bante elaborate more on the superior sensual pleasures? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, first, I didn't do that sutta, and maybe I'll do it next week. Okay, yeah, I, I wanted this in this class. I wanted to come to the contrast between the trainee, the powers of the trainee, and the, the five powers of the trainee, and the usual set of five powers. Right. So let's just put that, um, put that a question aside for now. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Okay, next is V. Yes, sir. Good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Um, I have um, a question regarding the panya on the cessation. Um, in respect of um, the feeling aggregate of the five khandas, so if uh, one be able to see the origin and, and the passing away of some of the very subtle irritation, however, it's still rising in a mind from time to time. So wonder whether Bhante could give some guidance on how to stop this subtle irritation from arising again and cease it completely. Any, any guidance on that? It's very subtle. Maybe I, I didn't quite get catch the question. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the, on the, um, the, the fifth factors is it that about the, um, the panya is to cease it completely on the pains or the defilement. Yeah. So um, say during meditation, yeah. um, you can see the origin and also the passing away of some very subtle irritation that arising yeah. and they're passing away. Yeah. But um, again and again, it arises again, yeah. you know, from time to time. So yeah. under this context, how do we stop it and cease it completely? <clears throat> yeah, as far as something like irritation, irritations go, those they will keep on arising. It's they're arising from the sort of the deep layers of the mind. But as you go on sort of contemplating and just I mean there are different techniques you can use to weaken, weaken their grip on the mind. One uh, sort of method is not to identify with that irritation and not take it to be I or mine, but just see that this is a mental state that arises when there are triggering causes and conditions and just observe it, let it 
arise and pass away. And over time, as one continues with that practice, you find that those types of states tend to grow weaker and weaker until they will arise very rarely. Of course, to get rid of them completely, then you have to reach the stage of the world transcending paths and fruits that eradicate the underlying tendencies. But um, in our day-to-day -day life, even with our meditation, those things will arise. And you just have to use any of the various methods that are appropriate for counteracting them. The simplest is just to observe with mindfulness, not identifying, but let it come, stand, and let it go. Okay, thank you. Can I ask one more question? Or um, I see there are a lot of hands. So yeah, I think we no have to worries, give every... Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, so that is V. So next is Anagarika Michael. Good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Uh, this is a quick one. I have a question regarding the power of energy. It seems like it's a commitment to right effort. What's the relationship between energy and right effort? Actually, that they're just different names for the same thing. I thought so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And we'll see later. It's a sutta that I didn't get to today because I wanted to leave time for questions. But when the Buddha raises the question, where is the power of energy to be seen? And it's to be seen in the four right efforts. I think it's sutta number 14. Okay, we go on now, Xiaoping. Thank you, Bandy, for taking my question. Okay. Uh, our question is about uh, uh, the power of wisdom. Yeah. And uh, I found why it's only mentioned arising and the personal way. It did not talk about the co-independence, co-dependence and the co-arising, even through the three times. What, what are the relationship between why seems that that aspect was not mentioned here? I'm having some trouble because of your, um, the microphone is giving, the sound has an echo quality to it. Oh, uh, I will speak slowly then I try. Mm. I, I don't think it's the speed at which you're speaking, but you could try, yeah, maybe try more slowly, but there's some, some quality in, this, in the microphone. I'm sorry, good to know. Okay. Uh, my, my question was, uh, the, the last uh, power, power of wisdom, yeah. it mentioned only arising and the personal way, yeah. but it did not mention the co-dependence and the arising, the, and even through the three times. Co-dependence through the three times. It's a 12 uh, uh, wait, it's a, uh, a dependent and co-arising. Dependent arising. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't forget that this is just, he has to give a very concise definition here. And so he's using just bringing in one formula, which is the wisdom that sees into the arising and passing away. But it doesn't mean that all of the other doctrinal principles are excluded. Of course, there'll be some understanding of dependent origination. Another place will give the object of wisdom is the Four Noble Truths. So this is just you could understand. And other places it will be anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, dukkha, non-self. So this is just a simplified way of defining the power of wisdom, but it doesn't mean that other things should be neglected. Okay, thank you, thank you, Bandi. Okay. Okay, next is Hong. Hong. Unmute. No. Can you hear me? I'm not getting it. I'm not. Just a very faint sound. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Barely. Uh, hello. 
Do you have a regular microphone? Yeah, it's a, a web microphone. Oh, just now I heard you. Okay. Ah, hello. Uh, thank you, Bente. The question on the uh, second point is uh, the power. Uh, the refer to the noble disciple. Is, is that a uh, hat? Is it an arhat? Yeah. No, it's referring to one who is not an arhat, who is in training. No, no the second. Why, why the different uh, five, five lists, the first list and the second list? Oh, the five powers, I see. Um, the, the five powers can be the possession of one in training or an arhat. It can be both. It's not necessarily an arhat. Yeah, well, but we have a different list of five powers. Yeah, yeah, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're just there. I don't. I haven't seen an explanation why the two separate lists. Am I need to ask a question? Can okay, I have a minute? Okay. okay. Wait, I, I hear two people speaking at the same time. Okay, let's go to Tom Cleary. Hi, Bonte. Thank okay, you very much. Clear. Okay, that's very clear. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the discussion of Otapa and Hiri. And I wanted to ask you about something, um, persons that have uh, issues with telling the truth or, or even perhaps in their own self understanding what is a lie and what is not. Yeah. And I wondered if you could speak to how these might play with these qualities of Otapa and Hiri. Um, and, and parenthetically, I don't know if this is true, but I heard, I thought somewhere that the Buddha in the Jataka tells never tells a lie. He commits all other transgressions, but never mm -hmm. tells a lie. And, I, and according to that idea, then lying would be perhaps the most uh, problematic of defilements to, to practice. And I wondered if there was perhaps, if that was true, and if it's true, if there's a connection between that and the lack of moral shame and uh, the, the fear of repercussions, the decreased fear of repercussions. Those people lying to themselves and to others and not understanding the reality of what they're doing. <clears throat> yeah, your question is, opens up many, many facets that should be addressed. And I don't have so mm. much time to deal with them. Uh, now. I understand. Um, uh -huh. But I have, if you have my little booklet, a small book, it's called The Noble Eightfold Path, The Way to the End of mm. Suffering. If you don't, you could download it. I think it's available on the internet. I have mm -hmm. a discussion of the different aspects, the consequences of the, the reason why Buddhism places so much emphasis on truth telling and places a heavy blame on lying. I've heard that statement about that in the Jatakas, the Bodhisattva has broken all of the precepts except the one of telling a, a, a lie. I don't know if that's the true or not. I haven't studied that. Okay. Okay, I just have time for one more question, and that will be Samantha Jayatelika. Thank you, Bante. Um, I was just um, in, uh, wondering why um, right, no, sorry, not right, mindfulness, the, the mindfulness and concentration, um, uh, especially the four foundations of mindfulness, which is one of the core, well, the core teachings of Buddha, why that's not incorporated in the, the Seika training? Because is that because at that stage you're, that should be uh, established anyway or something like that? Yeah, it's an interesting question because certainly the Buddha will expect the Seika to be practicing and developing the Noble Eightfold Path. And the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is right, uh, right mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And right mindfulness is the four foundations of mindfulness. So certainly it's included in the training of the, or the, the training of the trainee includes the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness. Why mm. it's, and then it's included in the definition of the power of mindfulness or where the, mm. yeah, where the power of mindfulness is to be seen Okay, that's sutta number 15. Mm. Okay, so the power, 
Yes, given concisely. So where is the power of mindfulness to be seen? The power of mindfulness is to be seen in the four foundations mm. of mindfulness. Oh. So that's in the power, though it's not specified as the trainee power. But certainly a trainee has to be practicing the four foundations of mindfulness. Mm. Okay, I'm going to have to okay. end the class now. And so we'll end with a brief sharing of the merits. So we share the merits with the devas, the human population, and with all sentient beings. Deva Naga Mahiti Kapun Yantang Anumodita Chirangra Kantu Sasana Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahiti Kapun Yantang Anumodita Chirangra Kantu Deisanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahiti Kapun Yantang Anumodita Chirangra Kantu Mankarang Dukkha pata chani dukkha, paya pata chani paya, soka pata chani soka, hantu sabepi pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. We go sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, 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 on the topic, this will be the contemplation of the body retreat, Kayanopasana. And the form for registering is up on the BAUS website. So if you're able to join us for that retreat, please register. Okay, so. Okay, so we could end with the BAUS, three BAUS of the Buddha. Okay, one. Two, three. In okay, back to okay. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Ben. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We all love you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank